Welcome to another of the State Historical Society of North Dakota's series, Conversations in North Dakota History. My name is Larry Remily. Today we will be talking with Jacqueline Peterson from Washington State University. Our program today is another of those sponsored and funded by grants to the State Historical Society of North Dakota from the North Dakota Humanities Council. Today's subject will be the history and place of the Métis peoples of northeastern North Dakota in the history of North Dakota and the Northern Great Plains. Welcome, Dr. Peterson. Thank you. <clears throat> to begin with, uh, let's establish the, uh, who the Métis are. And can you tell us uh, briefly, uh, who are the Métis people? That's a deceptively simple question. It's like asking, who is an American? Who is a Ukrainian? Uh, this term, Métis, I would suspect is familiar to at least those residents of the state who are living in the northern tier counties, but it's surprising to me that it's not a term that is recognizable to most citizens of the United States and not very far outside these borders. Uh, it's pronounced variously depending on, on, on who you're talking to as Métis, 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 Métis uh, at the Turtle Mountains. It's a French language term that means simply to mix. And I think its English language variant uh, is perhaps more recognizable to, uh, to most people, and that is the very pejorative term half-breed. Um, unfortunately, the term Métis really doesn't have anything to do, or only tangentially, about racial mixture, although the Métis people are the product uh, of a long and extensive set of relationships established beginning 300 years ago between native peoples and people of French and English and Scots and other European uh, national stocks. Um, but it doesn't really refer to individual sort of genetics. Rather, it's a term that describes like American or Ukrainian, an ethnicity and nationality uh, a sense of belonging to a group larger than a family with shared values, a shared way of life, a shared economy, uh, and at least in the case of the Métis in the 19th century, the aspiration uh, for a geographical homeland that they could claim as their own, a, a Métis nation. <coughs> how did the Métis originate on the Northern Plains? Well, that's again an interesting question. Uh, it's my belief that uh, the Métis can be traced all the way back to the St. Lawrence, I mean, to the very beginnings uh, of French Indian contact and the beginnings of the fur trade. And in a process of sort of rolling over and, and ever moving westward as the fur trade expanded, it was accompanied not just by the physical migration of hunting bands who were attached to the trade, but also by an extensive pattern of intermarriage between predominantly early on French Canadians uh, and native Algonquian women, whether they be members of, of uh, the Odawa, Ottawa, or Chippewa, or Ojibwe, or Potawatomi, or Menominee tribes. And this process actually took about 250 years to complete, even before uh, the Métis appear on the Northern Plains. Now, many people, I think, tr traditionally have believed that the Métis were uh, a Northern Plains phenomenon, and they are. I mean, there's no question that the Métis, I mean, are really unique uh, in the annals, really, of North American history. It's an extraordinary sort of story that a new people could come into being, and they are clearly tied to this place, uh, to that border region between North Dakota and Manitoba along the Red River. But there were, were several hundred years of sort of preparation for that event, and it's sort of built on this process of intermarriage and the developing set of trading towns beginning at Mackinac, Detroit, Chicago, Green Bay, the Sault Ste. Marie, Prairie du Chien, all of whom before 1800 had substantial populations of traders, native wives, and over several generations, in some cases several hundred uh, mixed blood offspring, who in a very sort of inchoate way had fashioned themselves a new people but were not yet calling themselves Métis. If it wasn't apparent to themselves, it was certainly apparent to outsiders. I mean, most of the commentary that we get in that 18th century milieu suggests that these are a people apart. Their language, their style of living, their architecture, their clothing, their landholding patterns seem in a peculiar kind of way to merge native and European patterns. Uh, and yet there is very little evidence in the documents that such people 
could clearly identify themselves as separate from native or white. And perhaps that's because they were part of a larger kind of pan-Indian fur trade culture that developed throughout the Great Lakes region. Everyone was tied to a single occupation. So that's only when the sort of process of searching for ever richer fur reserves, as one area is trapped out and there's a sort of a westward moving pattern, it's really only when you reach the entrance to the plains at the Red River beginning, I would say, about 1780 and really coming to fruition in the decade from 1800 to 1810, do you get suddenly an explosion based on this long buildup and a population base on which, of course, to build as well, the sort of explosion of a new way of life and a new identity that culminates in this sort of uh, self-congratulations that we are a people, we are a new people. Uh, neither native nor white. And uh, I think it's the plains. I mean, it was a coincidence of a number of factors that produced this new identity, this new nationality. But I think geography has a great deal uh, to do with it. Uh, the area along the Red River had historically been a kind of war road, uh, even though it had at one time been occupied by the Cheyenne and later by the Assiniboine and, and Cree. In the years leading up to 1780, and even between 1780 and 1800, it was a, an area that the Chippewa and the Sioux peoples contended for. Uh, and neither party was strong enough, really, to dominate the region. And they would come in, and they would trap occasionally, war with one another. But because no permanent village locations were established there, this was an extraordinarily rich uh, game preserve. And as western Minnesota began to uh, play itself out uh, circa 1780, and this coincides, I should note as well, with the formation of a new coalition of traders coming together into a new kind of conglomerate called the Northwest Company, who finally took on uh, the Hudson's Bay Company, and after 1780 began to spread rapidly up the Saskatchewan River into the greater Canadian Northwest, looking for ever uh, greater and richer fur preserves. The first uh, forays of Chippewa and trading people moving into the Red River Valley probably can be dated from the mid-1780s. Those were scary times. I mean, people would come out, uh, they would trap with great fear and trepidation that they might be attacked by the Sioux and return perhaps to their ancestral villages at Leech Lake, Red Lake, Rainy Lake, Fond du Lac, as far away, actually, I think, as Mackinac uh, and the Sioux. The first reported uh, post that was established at Pembina on the American side of the border dates from 1797-98. It was established by a man who was born at Mackinac with Métis relatives. His name was Charles Chaboyer. And I think it's significant that he brought with him not people from Montreal as servants, but rather homegrown people who later on would be Métis, uh, who had grown up at Mackinac and the Sioux, uh, Rainy Lake, and the hunters that accompanied him, Sautur people, many of them were from the Mackinac Sioux region and included some Ottawa people. Um, although, of course, his band also drew to that place people from nearby, such as at Red Lake uh, and Leech Lake and Rainy River. They were already actually Northwest Company posts at those locations, and so the new post at Pembina had to sort of lure uh, Chippewa people uh, further west into a frightening region. And especially frightening because at this time, uh, in 1797-98, I think by choice, the Chippewa people didn't yet have horses. And when they arrived at the bank of the Red, there, there were no, they were a canoe people. They were a woodland people. Uh, they hadn't yet uh, uh, learned really how to efficiently hunt the buffalo in any large measure. Uh, they didn't live in hide tents. Uh, they hadn't a special taste for buffalo meat or pemmican over wild rice or, uh, or fish. In other words, I mean, they were a woodland people who suddenly find themselves at the entrance to a whole new geographical environment that required new skills, a new understanding of how to deal with the ecology of that region. Obviously, the people were extraordinarily sophisticated, and given their many long years in the Great Lakes, of how to deal with that environment. But northern North Dakota is vastly different from eastern or north northeastern Minnesota. That particular post lasted only a year, uh, and it was reestablished in 1801 by Alexander Henry. I think it's significant that Henry's servants and 
hunters uh, to a large measure uh, duplicate or, or, or are very similar to the people that Chaboyer had uh, worked with three years earlier. Um, the same people, but they still didn't have horses. Mm -hmm. uh, and Henry is the first person who says, we must, we need horses. And so he buys some horses from people up on the Assiniboine River, uh, Assiniboines and, and Crees, and it's just, it's quite remarkable to me that within the space of three or four years, these people who had come to trap beaver, who were canoe people, suddenly made the transition to a wholly new way of life. And in making that transition, in becoming plains-oriented, in learning how to, to tap that environment and its resources, they developed a whole new uh, identity. So it was basically the transition to the plains that created the self-identification of the Métis as a unique people. Yeah, I really think so. Um, as I said, I mean, I think that one can find evidence of all the cultural components present beforehand further east, but it's in this sort of time frame between 1800 and 1810 when the transition is made to the horse and the development of the famous Red River cart and the sudden discovery that you don't have to be a servant. You don't have to work for one of the fur trade companies. You can use those carts to hunt buffalo and to provide pemmican, which becomes then a new kind of commercial activity. It is a quasi-merchant activity. I mean, this is not something that Sioux people did until much later, and never on the scale that Métis would, would, would in, engage in this kind of activity, which again suggests that there's a kind of a European component to this value system. Um, but it's a kind of freedom. It's a, new, it's a new economy, a new way of life. It's suddenly made possible by the acquisition of the horse and the invention of the Red River cart. Um, Why is the cart so important? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting. When Henry established the post at Pembina, he had with him uh, Ojibwe hunters from a number of villages further east and some Ottawa people. And he wished to tap uh, the trade with the western, more western Assiniboine and Cree, who were essentially trading with his rival, the Hudson's Bay Company. He wished to pull them down to the post at Pembina, but perhaps because of fear of the Sioux, perhaps, I mean, they weren't enemies of the Chippewa, but then they weren't the best of friends either. But for whatever reason, the Assiniboine refused to come to the post at Pembina and be part of Henry's trading post band. And so he was forced to establish a series of posts further west, a post at the Hare Hills, at St. Joseph, later Valhalla. In fact, I, one, I suppose, could say that Pembina and Valhalla I mean, are, were established virtually at the same time mm -hmm. uh, in 1801. Uh, and this became the post, and there will be later posts at, at the Turtle Mountains, at Devil's Lake, um, on Turtle River, that will be posts that are designed to tap the trade with the Assiniboine uh, and the Cree. Now, these aren't places to which one can carry large amounts of goods via canoe. Mm -hmm. I mean, suddenly, I mean, the fur trade is confronted with a sort of set of, of obstacles. They're both political because of the problem with the Assiniboine refusing to come to Pembina, but they're also uh, geographic and technological. And between 1801 and 1803, Henry's men, presumably the Métis portion of his, of his servant group, invented a vehicle which solved that problem and solved it dramatically. In the first year, in 1801, Henry says that the men had made some very small carts, and their wheels were uh, about three feet in diameter, and they had been cut from the end of a tree trunk. Um, I mean, that's an important, I think, advance, but it wasn't what they needed. And the following year, he says, suddenly someone has made a great improvement, that now they have created a cart that is perpendicular. The wheels are five feet in diameter, perfectly straight, not dished outwards. And he says, I mean, this has made all the difference in the world, that suddenly now we can haul large amounts of goods out and bring back uh, very heavy bags of pemmican and buffalo robes uh, and other smaller game animals from these inland posts. And then a year later, uh, he notes in his journal that one of his men had created uh, even a better wheel on the Canadian model. And he says, now we have capital carts. And in those three years, I mean, you can see this incredible transition. By 1803, he has so many horses that they need to build a stable at Pembina. And in that same year, we see, I think, the evidence. And it really is eerie, almost. It is a description of a procession mm 
of his men with their families uh, making their way from Pembina now to the Hare Hills Post at St. Joe. And it's like a description one would have found from the 1850s uh, of, the, of the Métis buffalo hunter cart trains uh, from these small beginnings. I mean, one already sees evidences in this description of uh, the transition to the horse, to the cart, to the canopies, colored canopies, using beaded smoking bags, pipe stems, a kind of even an ethos, I mean, a sense of, 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 of merriment and pranksmanship uh, for which the Métis uh, became quite famous uh, later on. And from these small beginnings uh, in 1803, of course, we can find ultimately by the 50s, I mean, the extraordinary uh, series of, of, of cart trades making their way from St. Joe, Pembina, and the Forks on the Canadian side to St. Paul. By 1865, some of these trains were 1,200 carts long, each cart carrying more than 1,000 pounds of pemmican, grease, buffalo robes, fancy articles for sale. It was said that the 65 train kicked up so much dust that it didn't settle in St. Paul for two weeks. Uh, and some people said that the sound, of course, now these wheels, I mean, have, it's all of wooden construction. Uh, and you can imagine what the sound was like. Some people suggested that it was like a thousand fingernails scratching on a window pane. Uh, they were also, of course, often followed by great clouds of mosquitoes. I mean, this was a, a kind of a, a glorious sort of summation of what had begun in such a small way. Uh, in 1803, and it provided the opportunity, I mean, a niche, an economic niche uh, for a people that I think was pretty crucial to their emergence as a fully-fledged ethnic or national identity. So the, the, the fortunate juxtaposing of a location, of an ethnic heritage, of a need for technology, mm -hmm. and of an economic opportunity basically are the foundations of the Métis culture. Well, and then there's another ingredient. And, and it's necessity. I mean, I personally feel that I've never, I've never much liked the, the way in which scholars have approached the origins of the Métis. I mean, it seems to me that the usual explanations somehow don't give Métis people any, cre any credit for knowing who they were or discovering themselves. Uh, the Canadian explanation is usually that uh, it was the Northwest Company suddenly faced with the establishment of an agricultural colony at Red River, at the Forks, at the very crossroads, really, of their fur trade empire, such a threat that they sort of instilled in the Métis a consciousness of their claim to the soil and their uniqueness, that they so inflamed them that people who had mixed ancestry were suddenly willing to come together and forcibly drive out the Selkirk colony. I find that kind of hard to believe. Uh, certainly, they did everything they could to incite the Métis to riot. Uh, but I, I feel quite confident that they were simply tapping a sense of commonality that had been present uh, for some long time. It is also true, and a, and a second kind of explanation, is that after 1780, we really begin to see the sort of race and caste lines tighten. Uh, on both sides of the border as this becomes an increasingly Anglo and Anglo-American dominated world. In the French period, before 1763, one could perhaps argue that there wasn't this intense racial consciousness, uh, that the French were more likely to label somebody French or Indian on the basis of how they dressed, how they spoke, how they lived. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that, that Anglo-Saxons and English speakers were far more likely after 1780 to make judgments simply on the basis of one's genetic composition or, or ancestry. And some scholars have argued that it was this sort of rising kind of racial thinking, racialism ultimately will become overt racism, uh, that sort of forced Métis people uh, into a position where they could not be accepted legitimately as white. And so if they were not to revert simply to a native identity, and many did, I mean, there's no question that in this period that many people of mixed ancestry, for all intents and purposes, were Indian, were Native. But again, this is as if to say that the Métis were invented from outside, uh, that forces beyond their control brought them into being. And I'd like to think that, while well, certainly most individuals in some periods in history have very little control uh, over their lives, I think that in this instance the Métis took advantage of a conjunction
uh, of opportunities and use them to produce a life way that was satisfying uh, as long as it as it did last. Now, the production of that life way also has geopolitical ramifications, does it not? It does. Let me go back. I, I didn't actually answer your last question mm -hmm. fully because there is one other factor. Mm -hmm. uh, that was important in bringing this population together. And that was the creation in 1801 of a very short-lived opposition company to the Northwest Company. It was called the XY Company. It was actually made up of former Northwesters. Mm -hmm. It would only last for four years. They would remerge in 1804. But during that four-year period, the number of people employed in the Red River Valley virtually doubled. Competition was intense, and large numbers of men, again, some of them being drawn from the Canadian Northwest, from the Saskatchewan, but many others being employed, again, from these towns throughout the Great Lakes region, brought to this place, to the Pembina St. Joe region, a much larger number of people than would have been true had the XY Company not existed. When the two companies reunited in 1804, suddenly, all of these men who had been employed by the XY Company, and for that matter, some of those who had been employed by the Northwest Company to staff posts that had to be established alongside the opposition, were thrown out of work. The same thing would happen again in 1821 when the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company merged. And many people say that they think that's the critical date, that 1821 uh, f freed so many thousands of people of mixed ancestry that that's really what established the core of, of the Métis people at Red River. But I think it's the earlier merger that is of greater significance. And I think one can even see this in Henry's journal. Uh, it's very interesting. In 1804, he has a very tough time hiring men at what he thinks are reasonable wages. I mean, competition is so stiff that everybody can exact what they want. And a year later, suddenly he says, I mean, it's pretty easy to hire people. People are really looking for, uh, for a job. And some of the people who had been drawn to the region would work for Henry, although he didn't think much of these people from the opposition. And some of them would also later work from time to time for the Hudson's Bay Company. But many of the others made a critical choice at this juncture. They had discovered that, in fact, Pemmican was to be the principal provisioning article for the expansion of the Northwest trade. And here they were in a perfect position to exploit that. And so Henry begins to note, beginning in 1805, that there are growing numbers of freemen with horses and carts living. The base, for the most part, is at St. Joe. Uh, along the base of the Hare Hall, Hare, Hare Hills, although some established themselves at, at, at Turtle Mountains very early on as well. But in four years, between 1805 and 1809, he notes the growing numbers of these freemen living in groups, hunting in groups, and bringing their pemmican in by cart. And that is the beginning. And it's an American beginning. I think that's what's so significant. I mean, this occurs on the U.S. side of the border. Not that that, of course, meant anything to the people at the time. And perhaps one could argue never meant anything to Métis people, since that was ultimately their homeland, neither Canadian nor U.S. But I think perhaps from our point of view or from North Dakota's point of view, it's important that, that this sort of real beginning, I think, can be traced to that decade, 1800 to 1810, around Pembina rather than at the Forks. Recall that this is the decade before the establishment of the Selkirk colony in 1811, and it is the decade before us, the first census that was taken at Red River by Peter Fiddler in 1815 lists a number of freemen living both at the Forks and Pembina. And what's significant is that most of these are the same men who had worked for Chabier or Henry R. listed as freemen who had been thrown out after the merger of XY and, and the Northwest Company. So that they are basically people who have been generated by the sort of fusion of, of, of uh, of factors in the Pembina area before 1815. Is it then, is it, is it not also true that there were international factors that led to the development of this consciousness of, uh, uh, on the part of the Métis people, of themselves as an independent, uh, substantial, unique people? Well, I, mean, I think, that, I mean, again, I mean, this is, this is of, of growing interest to me. Most, most historians have said, ah, oh, you know, Métis nation, how could they think they were a nation in 1816, you know, at the Battle of, of, of Seven Oaks? But they did have a flag, they had a national song, I mean, they clearly had organized themselves with leaders uh, and, 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 and attempted to establish a claim to the soil on the basis of occupancy and, and right of birth. 
it is clear to me that they were thinking in terms that approach nationhood. And I think it's significant that Cuthbert Grant, at least, I mean, he was probably the most important leader at that date in 1816, had been schooled in Montreal. Some people think that he had actually been to Europe, although I've never seen any, any substantiation of that claim myself. But I think it's likely that he, like everyone else, uh, was very cognizant uh, of what was going on in Europe during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, certainly had been great interest among the fur trade fraternity in the American Revolution. This was the age of nationalism. Uh, and I think it is not really surprising in a way that the educated elite uh, of the Métis would uh, simply take on uh, this new idea and apply it to themselves. I mean, that's perhaps partially an explanation why Métis group identity didn't form before 1800. I mean, in fact, it wasn't forming very many places in the world at all. I mean, it's after 1800 that nationalism really becomes the new watchword, the new paradigm for how to sort yourself out ethnically, politically, and socially. So I don't think that that's an inappropriate use of the term. And certainly in 1869, uh, and then again in 1885, when Riel and his followers talked about the Métis nation, the new nation, they knew what they were talking about. I mean, they really wanted nothing less. I mean, they wanted political control uh, and geographical control over those lands that they believed were their rightful inheritance. Was there some influence <clears throat> by the, the French uh, leader Napoleon in all of this, do you think? Well, I think, I mean, Métis were, after all, I mean, there were always, of course, both French and English-speaking Métis people at the Forks, and perhaps to a lesser extent uh, at Pembina. Having looked at the, um, the register at Pembina and the 1850 Minnesota Territorial and the 1860 Dakota Territorial censuses, my impression is that unlike the community at the Forks, which had a fair number, I mean, almost an equal number of men who and their families who had come out of the Hudson's Bay tradition, uh, or perhaps even the, the Northwest tradition where the father was Scots or mm -hmm. English or Irish rather than French. On the, on the U.S. side of the border, the vast majority of Métis people who were buffalo hunters were of French-Canadian ancestry. And if one finds English names, they are usually part of a family which has intermarried and has been really dominated by that time by the French side. I and mean, they're all French speakers. I think that Napoleon Bonaparte, I mean, really captured the imagination. Uh, of French-speaking people everywhere. Uh, and Métis were French-speaking people. I mean, they weren't French Canadians, but they had a sense of themselves. And remember, I mean, French Canadians saw themselves as a colonized people in this period. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an equal sort of emphasis in the eastern part of Canada to hang on for survival, survivance, I mean, to preserve language, religion, culture. And the Métis, in a sense, I mean, I think can lean upon that cultural strength and persistence. And, uh, and, and Bonaparte, I mean, is sort of a glorious example of, 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 of French culture and intellect and, and, and military power. So, yeah, tremendously important. A number of Métis families named their children uh, for Napoleon uh, after 1850. A few moments ago, you used a very interesting term. Uh, you talked about the Mét uh, a Métis upper class. I'm wondering if you could describe the composition of the Métis society. <laughs> I am not nearly so clear about class divisions, if in fact they existed on the American side of the border. It's much easier to see what might be termed classes, although I'm not real comfortable uh, with that term. But one can see, certainly see different kinds of economic adaptations on the part of peoples who assume or share a Métis identity, at least at, at Red River. I mean, there was a sort of a subclass of people who really were so poor that they couldn't even afford horses or carts. I mean, they couldn't go on the twice yearly buffalo hunts or engage in that traffic at all. I mean, they were the poorest of the poor and they basically continued to fish and eke out a living on the margins of society. On the other hand, there were a fair number of people of Métis ancestry, although I think for the most part, these were the folks who came out of the Canadian Northwest tradition, m many of them with uh, English or Scots surnames and were English speakers. Many of these people continued to work for the Hudson's Bay Company as trip men which is to say they continued to be part of the actual operation 
of the fir tree. They were bound. They were servants. Now, the Hudson's Bay Company, I must say, just as it was true in, in the South after 1780, consistently over the 19th century gave Métis people less and less opportunity. It became more and more difficult to rise even to the position of clerk. Uh, in fact, they created a new, a new occupation which really I mean, had no significance called postmaster. And this was a way, essentially, to give Métis sons of older traders some kind of job. But they weren't regarded as somehow qualified to move into the upper echelons. I mean, there is this sense of sort of caste tightening and sort of pushing people out. But it does seem to me that there were a number of people whose, par whose fathers had been prominent in the Hudson's Bay Company or the Northwest Company, and then after the merger, they were still prominent in the combined company, who wanted to find a place for their children and their sons in this larger Anglo-dominated world. And I think one would have to say that those people were significantly different. I mean, if they weren't wealthy or they lived in a different style of life, many of them were Protestant from those French-speaking Métis and some English-speaking Métis who have married into these French-speaking families who opted for the hunt and the provisioning trade. Whether they lived for the most part of the year at the Forks or on the south side of the border, which in the period from about 1824 to 1843 or so appears to have been abandoned because the Hudson Bay Company pulled out its own post and, and the missionary. But I think there were plenty of people who remained on the US side of the border. And thousands more came uh, to permanently reside on the south side of the border again after 1843, when uh, the newly created, now defunct American Fur Company was able to establish, for the first time again, a competition post at Pembina, at Turtle Mountain, uh, and at St. Joe. I mean, this is the beginning of Norman Kitson and Antoine Jean Gras and James Sinclair over at Turtle Mountain. But I think there were people always who saw their, their primary base as Pembina, St. Joe. But those people who opted for the hunt and for the provisioning traffic were free. And one gets the sense that they always thought they were free. The Hudson, they were the bane of the Hudson's Bay Company's uh, economic uh, existence because they perpetually tried to play the US off the Canadian side and were constantly taking their goods, smuggling their goods across the border. I mean, this culminated in a kind of a, a series of trials and a free trade crisis uh, in the late 1840s, and the Métis won. Uh, in a very, very important trial, the Sayer trial in 1849, for all intents and purposes, the Hudson's Bay Company threw up its hands and said, continue to do as you always have done. And that really did open the floodgates. I mean, that sets the stage for major caravans now on a yearly basis uh, to St. Paul. And I, I suppose in some ways, I mean, the, the Hudson's Bay Company finally realized they might as well get with the program because they ultimately realized that their, their best route was to bring materials up from St. Paul rather than being supplied via the Lake Superior route. But after 1849, what had always been a kind of surreptitious sort of business, I mean, exploded into a major merchant activity. And there were a number of French-speaking Métis like Jean Gras, I mean, who did exceptionally well. I think it's unfair, however, to sort of care. I'm not certain that one can characterize Jean Gras as part of an upper class. I suppose he was. I mean, I suppose Joseph Rowlett Jr. was a member of that class, too, the storekeepers, the post owners, uh, whereas the rank and file of the hunters, uh, some of them were only still living in skin tents, although by the 1850s there are descriptions of about anywhere from 80 to 100 houses, log houses at St. Joe, and encampments strung along the river below for stretching for 15, uh, 15 miles. But one doesn't really get the sense, except for the Jean Gras and the Roulettes at the top, that there are clear sort of class divisions on the American side. The basis for this entire system, however, was the hunt. Absolutely. Can you describe how the hunt was organized and operated? Well, it was absolutely organized on a, on a Sioux system. Um, that is to say that, and again, I, I suppose I should back up here too. Um, there's no question that the Métis, like their Plains Ojibwe relatives, became a Plains people. I mean, their culture uh, was, I suppose, more of a merger now of, of, of French or quasi-European values and uh, dress and clothing. I mean, certainly religion is something that for Métis people is the divide. I mean, Métis people are Christian and for the most part Catholic, whereas their Plains Ojibwe relatives remained uh, traditional believers. 
Uh, but both of these groups, in sort of making that sort of fatal crossing, the river, uh, and taking on the horse uh, and the cart, uh, learned a new way of life, and for the Plains Ojibwe, at least, I mean, uh, sun dancing as well. well. Where did this come from? I mean, the Sioux had been the hereditary enemies uh, of the Ojibwe and Ottawa people, so it's pretty unlikely that they served as the teachers. Mm. Uh, I think rather that it was the Assiniboine. I mean, again, it was the establishment of that post at St. Joe where the Assiniboine were encamped and the Chippewa were allowed to live with them, that they began to take on uh, this sort of value system and understanding about, about the plains. I don't know to what degree, at least in terms of the hunt itself, we do know that the organization of the hunt into captains and scouts and guides, and which were designed really to ensure that uh, when a herd was discovered, that no over-anxious uh, hunter after, after glory uh, hit the herd so soon that the large number of people who had made their way uh, to that place on the plains wouldn't have the opportunity to take as many animals as possible. I mean, it was very, very strictly organized, highly disciplined, and it was modeled after the, uh, the plains hunt. I mean, it was not, I mean, some people say this looks like a sort of a European political system. It wasn't. I mean, the captains were elected before the hunt began. Uh, there were, in addition, uh, t 10 scouts for each 10 captains and, uh, and 10 guides, I mean, who were variously responsible for locating the camp each day, getting it set up, make sure that they were adequately encircled and protected, uh, for essentially leading the charge when it began and to keep everybody under, uh, under control. Uh, it was said by... Um, Antoine Belcourt, I mean, the priest who established uh, the church in 1848 at Pemba and then one several years later at St. Joe, uh, that in the 40s that Métis hunters each were taking 77 buffalo, which sounds like an awful lot, um, an awful lot. But some of these cart trains on the hunt uh, were three, 500, 700 carts long, and when you think about the number of, of buffalo that are involved, you, it's not surprising that the Sioux complained loudly about how the Métis were in part responsible for the demise of the buffalo population uh, in North Dakota. They did, in fact, I mean, pose uh, a threat, I think, to the subsistence uh, of Sioux people because theirs was a quasi-commercial activity. They were not hunting for subsistence, and they weren't hunting even just to find fine robes to ship to the traders, but rather they were engaged in the provisioning trade. Uh, and it's interesting to me that Father Belcour's 1845 account suggests that they were particularly interested in slaughtering the cows, that cow meat provided the best pemmican, that, and that this is something I didn't realize until quite recently, that it would appear that at least in their normal grazing habits that cows and bulls did not graze together. When the cows were approached or attacked, the bulls rushed within them. But uh, in this account, uh, the bulls were located first, and one was killed for meat. And there's a sort of comment that that's not the best meat, and they're looking for the cows. Well, I mean, if that's true, I mean, if the Métis selectively slaughtered cows, that would have been even more devastating, I suppose, than the fact that they were, I mean, they already were you know, engaged in a much larger scale buffalo hunting operation than was typical of Plains tribes. And then back to this business about ecological adaptation, I mean, it's conceivable that the Métis, having only so recently arrived on the Plains, may not have had that sort of sensitivity uh, to habitat and, and, and species control that Plains peoples themselves did. That's an open question uh, at this point. My hunch is that it really, I mean, it was, it was the coming of the railroads and the hide hunters, I mean, that did the herds in. But there's no question, I think, that, that Métis commercial provisioning put a strain on the population. What other kinds of interaction did the Métis have with the Sioux? Was it all hostile? Was it all confrontational? Well, there certainly were <laughs> hostilities and confrontations. In fact, a lot, a lot of, I think, the, the sort of Métis folklore uh, so the glorious days of the buffalo hunt revolve around uh, those conflicts and their, and their victories. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, I think that uh, we can certainly find a lot of evidence of intermarriage between Métis people, or for that matter, French-Canadian people and, and the Sioux, or Siouan speakers. Although it's interesting to me that a separate sort of ethnicity or identity, a group identity, doesn't appear to have emerged within Siouan society. 
And I'm not exactly certain why that is. I mean, maybe it's because those, that critical century, I mean, from 1780 or 1775 to 1876, uh, was a time of, I mean, incredible change, flashiness, wonderful fluorescence on the part of the Plains tribes, a rise to power. And, I mean, they had their own thing going. And, uh, I mean, they found their niche. And, and so I, I suppose there almost wasn't even room. I mean, everyone was tied so much intimately to, to the buffalo, to the Sundance, to the extended family, uh, to this way of life that, that people, I'm certain, who were of mixed ancestry simply became Sioux. Uh, and let it go with that. And let it go with that. Right. Well, let me ask a little bit about the way of life followed by Métis families, if I may. Uh, we've spoken almost entirely about male-oriented occupations <laughs> thus far. What about <clears throat> the women in Métis families? And what was their role, and how did they function within that society? Well, I mean, certainly women were absolutely integral to the hunt, <laughs> right? I mean, men may have, I mean, had all the glory on horseback, uh, but once the the buffalo had been cut up on the plains, the carts were moved in and uh, uh, portions of the buffalo were selectively carved into strips. Uh, drying racks had been prepared mostly by, uh, I think, branches that were collected from the hair hills. Uh, and women were responsible for the drawing, the pounding, the mixing of pemmican, which had several grades. I mean, the best grade, I mean, had choke cherries or other kinds of berries mixed in with the, the grease and, and the meat. Uh, that was an extraordinarily laborious operation. Uh, women also, I think, were the principal artisans. Uh, Métis are known, and, and rightly so, for, I think, uh, some brilliant uh, displays of artistry and bead and quill working, using, for the most part, floral motifs. And some of these objects, whether they be mittens or men's coats, sort of modeled after the tailored uh, coats of the times, or soldiers' coats, some with epaulettes and whatever, became very highly valued kind of tourist items. Uh, by the 1850s, and women were the principal artisans. Women were also, of course, the principal child rearers. Mm -hmm. uh, they held the family together. And one gets the impression, too, that, I mean, Catholicism is, there's no question in my mind, I mean, one of the core denominators of Métis identity. It is what separates Métis from Chippewas, mm -hmm. uh, traditional Chippewas. And, and I think it's women. I think it was Métis women who were really the most important transmitters of that culture. I mean, you have to learn to be somebody, you know, and you are enculturated within a family setting. And I think it was Métis women who were certainly the most active members of the missionary churches were ever established, who were the guardians not only of the faith, you know, but the guardians of the culture. So the women played basically the nurturing part of the culture as well as, play, as having a role in the economic activity of the culture as well. Well, speaking of that culture, are there, were there, what were the unique characteristics of the Métis culture as we know it, the music and the dance and the literature and that sort of thing? Well, I, again, I mean, I mean they, they have the elements that every culture has, right? I mean, I mean in fact, when you, I, I wasn't being facetious when early on I said that that's like asking who is an American. I mean, if I asked you, what are the core ingredients of an American culture? I mean, what would you say? McDonald's hamburgers? <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, it's somehow, I mean, you take these things for granted. But I think one of the ways that we know that the Métis were a full-fledged ethnic group striving for nationhood is, is the evidence that, in fact, all of the sort of cultural components were in place. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, there, there's a, a body of song, of folklore, of story, uh, dances, uh, brilliant artisanry. And what's interesting about all of this, of course, is that it does seem to be, in every one of these aspects, a kind of fluid merging of both the native and the European side. I mean, I am not an ethnomusicologist, but in attempting to sort of understand the music that is still being played uh, at Turtle Mountains, certainly much of that music is a rendition or dependent upon very old French Canadian tunes. But I think it's striking and I think apparent to anyone's sort of ear that, that much of that music has been very much influenced uh, by native musical forms. Uh, and the same with the dance. Now, in terms of dress, uh, Métis were very known for uh, their flamboyant way of dressing. Uh, 
uh, utilizing, for the most part, I think, hide clothing, these wonderful hide coats uh, embellished with beadwork or, or quill work and lavish floral patterns uh, with a beaded tobacco pouch hung from a Red River uh, finger-woven sash. I mean, the real hallmark. Uh, if you wore your sash outside your coat rather than under it, I mean, you, you were a Métis. Uh, certainly, they also wore the traditional capotes uh, and, and moccasins, but it really is the sash and the beaded pouch bag and the, and, and the leather coat. Now, women, uh, women, for the most part, dressed in black. Uh, all they, although, again, I think that's probably the Catholic, French Catholic influence, uh, demure and modest, but they also wore over their black garments. And I'm not just saying that every Métis woman wore black, but that was a preferred color for the basic dress. And then over that, that you wore uh, a colorful skull, shawl, uh, which uh, was acquired usually for the traders. I mean, some of them were kind of plaids, and uh, others were uh, single colors. And one could normally, too, find uh, a lot of religious um, jewelry, crucifixes, and whatever that women uh, adorned themselves with. An integral part of culture is also language. You know, mm -hmm. Can you describe the Métis language? Is it different from French and Indian? Uh, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's both, yeah. <laughs> or neither. Uh, I think for a long time people said, and I think even Métis or Michif people themselves for a long time said, oh, I'm kind of embarrassed of this because it's like a it's like not a real language. I mean, or it's not good French, or it's not good Cree. Well, that's right. It's its own language, uh, as we're discovering. And that's very exciting. I mean, you know that when a people have formed their own way of talking, that we're talking about time depth here. Uh, it takes a very, very long time for languages uh, to change or to reform themselves. And linguists like John Crawford at the University of North Dakota have determined that Métis, while perhaps one could say that the dominant element is Cree, really is a regular mixture of French and Cree. It's not uh, irregular or, or by happenstance, in other words, that it seems to be a combination of Cree verbal forms and French noun forms. Uh, it is spoken uh, at Turtle Mountains and a number of reserves and non-reserved communities in both Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Uh, I think it's very exciting that finally people are being a, you know, willing to recognize this as a, as a unique language, uh, deserving of much greater study than it has received because, I mean, again, I mean, the Meiji people are really quite unique uh, in the history of North America. I mean, this is an unusual and wonderful story because it's sort of the exception to that sort of awful saga uh, of, of disease, death, and destruction uh, brought on by the encounter of Indian and white. Uh, and however brief that fluorescence was in the nationhood stage, uh, the Métis are at least proof that those relations did not always have to end uh, in, a, in a truly negative and devastating way. The culture then basically flowered in the middle 19th century with the, 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 grand, the grand expansion of the cart trains and the tremendous uh, annual hunts right. for the buffalo. Uh, how did it progress? But you know, you never know. You never can see, I don't think, uh, how rapidly these things can come to an end. I mean, almost at the moment of its height, it was over. Uh, I mean, so many things, again, just like in the period between 1800 and 1810, between 1860 and 1870, I mean, there were a number of events that came together that, that just sort of, again, almost overnight, wiped out sort of the economic rationale uh, and way of life underlying uh, Métis society. Uh, and I'm not sure that anybody at the time, I mean, I think they must have known that, but, but you know, everybody doesn't know that. Uh, I mean, in 65, we've got, you know, a car train, 1,200 carts long. I mean, Jean Gras is listed as being worth $60,000. It was a lot of money uh, in those days. Uh, they were probably 1,200 to 1,500 people living at St. Joseph. I mean, it was things were booming. Population at Red River was up substantially. But the buffalo herds were beginning to diminish. Mm -hmm. uh, by 73, they would be gone uh, east of the Missouri. And in 68, the Canadian government decided that it finally ought to have uh, that Red River area for its own. And the Hudson's Bay Company already, I mean, I'm seeing again for itself sort of the uh, the handwriting on the roll, it's at least economically, uh, was willing, you know, to make the transfer to the Canadian government. Mm 
And uh, this was, of course, without any consultation with the Métis people who were the residents of the region. And from their perspective, I mean, the true owners of the land. I mean, they'd had their problems with the Hudson's Bay Company over the years. And, and they had, for all intents and purposes, I mean, one a say, a kind of say, uh, in how the colony was governed. And certainly most of them, if they hadn't been given actual grants of land by uh, the company, considered that their titles were secure. Uh, and suddenly, uh, in 69, I mean, we have the arrival of a surveyor uh, who is now essentially taking it upon himself uh, to survey lands already occupied and presumably owned by Métis people in a rectangular or grid fashion. Now, the Métis always laid them, their, their lands out in the same in the old French-Canadian pattern. That is to say, these were sort of string farms using the river as the principal road uh, and so that the house would be close by the water's edge, and then behind would be uh, fields, gardens, and whatever, and then ultimately back, the backwoods were used uh, for firewood. And um, access to the river was absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, when you get a surveyor in who pays absolutely no heed to people's improvements and, and threatens, essentially, by imposing a new kind of, of structure to deny people the privileges you know, that they felt had been theirs uh, for, for a very long time. I mean, this created just tremendous fear and consternation among uh, the Métis population on both sides of the border. I mean, we're not talking here about an international boundary that really is effective. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it, 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 the, the group that attempted to turn back, and did in fact turn back the governor, the newly arriving lieutenant governor of, of the Canadian colony, William McDougall, included uh, Roulette uh, and Jean Gras, so that these people knew that they had a common, a common stake in what was about to happen. Um, the Hudson's Bay Company was so weak and ineffectual at this point in time that once the arriving governor had been turned back, it was not able to exert itself to regain political control or to, or, or to maintain, essentially, you know, quiet and safety. Uh, in the colony, and so it was up to Louis Riel and some of his followers to establish a provisional government in the interim. Uh, this wasn't really rebellion. Uh, this was essentially taking on the reins of government in the absence of any other. Um, and what's remarkable about this is that even though it, I mean, it was a relatively, I mean, it was a bloodless, virtually uh, uh, a provisional government, except for the fact that a fatal sort of error was made. I mean, one of the Orangemen, William Scott, was, uh, I, think, I think he just got Riel's goat. Uh, and, he, and I think that was a fatal sort of mistake. But uh, he was hung, and all of eastern Canada, you know, was up in arms about these savages out there. And, uh, mm -hmm. And this, of course, led to, ultimately to, uh, to Riel's banishment. Uh, and he was almost a kind of fugitive wanderer uh, for the next uh, 10 years, even though his own people from his district twice elected him uh, to parliament, but he was never able to take, take his seat. Um, but he won for the Métis people some very, very important uh, rights, although not all of them uh, would pan out in the end. Uh, it was really at Riel's insistence that this area be treated as an already settled, self-governing region uh, that Manitoba was admitted as a province. I mean, given the American model, one would have assumed that when the Hudson's Bay Company turned over this territory to the Canadian government, that for a long time to come it would be regarded as a territory, right? Ruled from, uh, ruled from back east. But the major sort of victory that, that Riel's people achieved was the admission uh, of that area as, as a self-governing uh, province, as much as one can be self-governing uh, in, uh, in the British system uh, at that time. But, and there was a tremendous also um, uh, concession in the way of preservation of, of Catholic language, or Catholic religion, uh, of French language, and guarantees about lands not only already occupied, but lands for the children of those people who were occupying lands. Unfortunately, uh, many of them were not surveyed promptly enough, script was issued. Many of those people, and, and of course migration begins from, from the east, and uh, many of them were forced to flee to the south side of the border, which many did. I mean, again, the Pembina population was augmented um, by Métis people who were relatives in many instances, but who, who uh, saw that they had lost their lands and couldn't live under this new order, and so moved to uh, the American side. Simultaneous with this, of course, is that you have the ever-advancing railroad. And because of, of Indian treaties signed and lands opened, the ever-encroaching tide of, 
of white settlement as well across Minnesota. Uh, in 1870, uh, the railroad reached Breckenridge, and that was it. That was it. I mean, that was five years after, I mean, the biggest cart train ever. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, there really wasn't a need for this overland traffic. And also, the buffalo themselves are dwindling. There's pressure now from, from, from settlers on both sides of the border. And so in this period, between 70 uh, and 85, a large number of Métis people on both sides of the border on the, along the Red went to Saskatchewan, uh, on the Saskatchewan River, on the South Branch, where they went into Montana, uh, ultimately to the Judith Basin, but establishing communities on the Sun and the Milk and the Teton uh, River. Belcourt estimated that after 1870, there were probably 4,000 Métis people living in Montana who were from the American side of, of the Red River uh, community. And then suddenly there weren't any more buffalo. And uh, the Métis sort of slipped through the cracks. And they disappear, basically. Well, I don't think that's true. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in fact, uh, in fact, one could argue that there are probably close to a million Métis, people of Métis extraction, and who so identify themselves on, along both sides of the border, in those northern tier states and the western provinces. But with the exception of Turtle Mountains. Uh, and Rocky Boys in Montana, and perhaps even Fort Peck to a far lesser extent, Métis people were not able uh, to acquire uh, rights to reservation land. And of course, when they did so, it was only when they could be identified or, or were willing to so identify as Indian. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a real dilemma. Of course, many Indian Métis people had to do that and did do it. It's ironic that Riel, Riel himself, you know, became an American citizen uh, when he was in Montana uh, in the early 1880s. And he wrote to the U.S. government several times trying to uh, acquire land for his people in Montana, uh, a separate Métis reservation. But the United States government had never been willing, I mean, how could one ignore you know, tens of thousands of people, but unwilling always to acknowledge that Métis people had the same kinds of permanent rights to a homeland that Native peoples did. I mean, the U.S. government's ploy was always to try to extinguish whatever claim to a title by relationship to Indians by offering Métis people uh, small portions of land or financial payments, and that was then to extinguish for all time uh, any future claim that they might have to the kinds of, of land rights that Indian people still retain. Would it be safe, to, would it be fair to say, to say, to summarize and say that the, the Métis experience along the North, along the Red River in North, Eastern North Dakota, Southern Manitoba was basically the rise of a people, the dominance of a region, the dominance of a geographical region and the establishment of a culture kind of simultaneously and then due to factors beyond their control the diminishment, the diminishing, and, and, and then the, uh, and the dispersal. dispersal. That's right. I mean, it's... Um, and is, is that... Uh, but that, that, I think that's a very accurate portrayal, but I mean, I would want to hasten to add that, that Métis culture and Métis identity is by no means dead. I mean, it's, a, it's alive and well, despite the fact, despite the fact that, that in many quarters, in mean, places like Montana, on the, on the edges of reservations, I mean, Métis people are the poorest of the poor. I mean, are, are people really caught in between, uh, who really deserve, I think, after these many, many years, far greater uh, attention and, and, uh, and benefits than they have received in the past. And with the work of scholars such as yourself, they will be receiving this, I hope, in the near future. Well, I hope so. I was frankly very heartened. I don't think it's going to happen in the U.S., but I was very heartened to see that the new Canadian Constitution in its Bill of Rights includes an aboriginal rights provision, which essentially guarantees the aboriginal and treaty rights of its native peoples, which are identified as Indians, Inuits, and Métis. There Thank is you. promise. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Our topic for this, uh, for this uh, conversation in North Dakota history has been Heartland into Homeland, the Métis peopling of the northern Red River Valley. This program is another in our series of conversations in North Dakota history. Our guest 
for today's program has been Dr. Jacqueline Peterson from Washington State University. My name is Larry Remily. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.